Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning from wherever you are in the world. My name is Lisa Benjamin, and I'm your moderator for today's panel. We're really thrilled to be presenting a timely panel entitled Flattening the Curve, COVID-19 and Climate Change. This is sponsored by the ABA section of Civil Rights and Social Justice. And this panel is one in many of a series of rapid response webinars. We're actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues. So please visit AmericanBar.org backslash CRSJ for updates on these programs. Before I go into our program and um, housekeeping uh, notes, I'd like to introduce Judy Perry Martinez, president of the American Bar Association for some introductory remarks. Well, well, thank you, Lisa, very much. And thank you all who have joined here today uh, for this wonderful and important discussion on flattening the curve of the coronavirus and the parallels to rampant climate change. Um, I wanna thank the ABA section on civil rights and social justice and the Environmental Law Institute for their co-sponsorship and support of what I know will be a wonderful webinar. You know, like the, the pandemic, uh, we are seeing the adverse effects of climate change and. We know that it knows no boundaries and both can affect us at all, but they seem to have a disproportionate impact on vulnerable populations and communities. And both of those are global issues with hyper local effects. So the parallels here are significant. And the American Bar Association has uh, shown its support and action to address climate change. In August of 29, the ABA through its House of Delegates adopted policy that calls for a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions to net zero or below. And the policy encourages lawyers to engage in pro bono activities to address climate change and advise their clients of the risk and opportunities that climate change provides. Like most sectors, the legal profession contributes to greenhouse gas emissions, although at a smaller scale certainly than manufacturing or energy production does, but the legal community is already addressing our contribution. And the ABA section of civil of, of environment, energy and resources and the EPA, H, EPA's law office climate challenge and the American legal industry sustainability standards show how law firms and lawyers can take individual steps to ensure that their practices and work environments promote sustainability. In early May, the New York Times reported on a survey involving the National Academy of Sciences, noting that within 50 years, as the climate continues to warm and the global population rises, up to one third of the world's population is likely to live in areas that are too hot for humans. And that's certainly a sobering finding. On the positive side, cited in The Economist in late May, is that the pandemic has resulted in a drop in greenhouse gas emissions, estimated to be 10% less than 2020. However, the reduction in travel and commuting emissions during the pandemic is not in any sense enough to reach climate goals. So we stand at this moment of innovation and the damage the pandemic has caused has opened discussion on how to rebuild and recover smartly. And through May and June, we've heard about dozens of world leaders in business, finance and politics convening to discuss how the global economy can be reset with climate change as a defining theme as nations recover from the pandemic, devising and implementing lasting solutions for communities with differing needs requires a collective effort. Climate change remains a defining challenge of our times. And I can tell you as a born and raised New Orleanian where I live now, this, an, this issue is important and personal to me. As nations around the globe enter various phases of reopening after months of stay-at-home orders were instituted, there are increasing efforts to curb the spread of COVID. And as we continue, all of us continue to learn about this pandemic and the effects of climate change, I look forward to the insights of this panel and to their expertise on these matters. So I thank all of the wonderful speakers and really appreciate their bringing their expertise forward to share with all of us and I know we'll have an invaluable discussion. Thank you on behalf of the entire ABA. Thank you very much, Judy. So just a few uh, housekeeping notes. To, uh, during today's program, we encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A function and not the chat function. Um, if you don't see the controls, make sure your screen's not idle and then you can uh, reinvigorate the controls. 
So we'll address questions at the end. Our speakers will have 12 to 15 minutes um, uh, to speak. And we'll also be sharing a recording of the program to everyone who's registered so you can share the recording widely on your social network. So with that, we're really thrilled to um, bring you today's program, Flattening the Curve, um, COVID-19 and Climate Change. I'd also like to uh, reiterate Judy's thanks to the th uh, three committees of the section on civil rights and social justice. These committees are Environmental Justice, Economic Justice, and International Human Rights Committees. You're all here uh, because you are aware that the effects of COVID-19 and climate change are systemic, extreme, nonlinear, and have cascading and largely inequitable effects on society. In the United States, communities of color and low-income communities, many of whom make up the categories of essential workers, have been devastated by the impacts of COVID-19. Decades of segregated housing policies, discriminatory siting of fossil fuel facilities and highways near or sometimes even through these communities have led to underlying health conditions such as respiratory issues, cardiac disease, cancer, obesity, and diabetes, which of course make these communities more vulnerable to the impacts of COVID-19. A 2019 study by the University of Washington pointed to pollution inequity, so the racial dimensions of pollution. And they found that fine particulate matter is disproportionately caused by consumption of goods and services, mainly by the non-Hispanic white majority of American populations, but disproportionately inhaled by black and Hispanic minorities. In the international context, a 2019 report by the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Climate Change stated that the world is heading towards what they called a climate apartheid, where the rich pay to escape heat and hunger, while the rest of the world, uh, predominantly poor communities, suffer the consequences of emissions that they're largely not responsible for. The Paris Agreement agreed in 2015 has a bottom-up structure and has annual conference of party meetings. This year's uh, COP meeting has been delayed due to the impacts of COVID-19 has been moved to the end of 2021. So as a result of that structure and the delay, it means that climate action is really centered on national and subnational actions uh, for uh, the near future. Both COVID-19 and climate change require collective action. They require rethinking our economic systems and shifting incentives to protect public goods like clean air and a safe atmosphere. And responses should also be science-based and protective of human rights. The original window on what's possible may be shifting. So uh, things that previously seemed unfeasible, like universal basic income, increases in minimum wage, Green New Deals, targeted investments in low-income and communities of color now look a lot more feasible. Today's webinar is going to look at the role of lawyers in facilitating this kind of meaningful change. I'm so excited to uh, introduce our uh, four panelists. Uh, the, Sarah Bonin is a faculty director for the Center of Energy and Environmental Law at the University of Connecticut School of Law. Michael Gerard is the Andrew Sabin Professor of Professional Practice at Columbia Law School and faculty director of the Sabin Center for Climate Law at the Columbia Law School. Tracy Roberts is an associate professor at the Cumberland School of Law at Sanford University. And Adam Zipkin is the legislative counsel of the, for the United States Senator Cory Booker. We're going to start with um, Sarah. So Sarah is an associate, uh, sorry, an architect and attorney who runs the University of Connecticut uh, School of Law's Center for Energy and Environmental Law and chairs the City of Hartford's award-winning Planning and Zoning Commission. She sits on the board of, sustainable, of the Sustainable Development Code and serves as an advisor to the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Through the American Law Institute, she's the um, primary author of the forthcoming land use volume of the fourth restatement of property. There you have the floor. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thanks to the ABA for having me. So originally when we were first starting discussing this panel, I think I was asked to join uh, primarily because I just published a piece uh, called What the Pandemic Can Teach Climate Attorneys, which is very on point, I think, with what we were talking about today. But as we led up to the panel, um, I think you know, that as the weeks kind of went on, the tide has turned. And so I think what I'm gonna talk about today at the request of, of the other panelists and the ABA is mostly talk about uh, state and local issues as these uh, COVID climate and racial justice issues are intertwined. Um, so both Judy and Lisa gave an excellent introduction to the scope of um, the issues that, uh, are, that are at stake at the intersection of all of these areas. Um, but I'm gonna just touch on a couple of other things uh, and, and briefly frame climate COVID and justice, uh, talk about some state and local issues, and then I'll circle back around to that article, which I think, again, what may have prompted the first invitation, uh, the invitation to begin with, 
um, but uh, it, we'll circle back around to it at the end. So just on this, this framing of climate, COVID, and justice. So climate justice is racial justice. Um, relating to the pandemic, as we've seen, um, climate has played an integral role in the and how the pandemic has uh, has has uh, developed over the last few months. So we've seen uh, the impacts of emissions go down. And again, this was already mentioned. Um, we've seen uh, the the fact that climate change may have caused uh, the uh, spread of the disease, the interaction with animals and humans uh, may give rise, and, and the, to seeing that this pandemic is is giving rise to species human interactions down the line. Or, or relating to or, or prefacing them rather. Um, the other thing that we've seen with the coronavirus though is that the greatest impact of coronavirus is on the poor. And we've seen that again and again for those of us working in the environmental community on climate too. Um, so we've seen that climate affects, affects the poor quite a bit. Wrapped up right now, as we all know during the pandemic is an, another push um, but a long simmering and long overdue push for racial justice and racial equality um, through the Black Lives Matter movement and other sources. Um, people just feeling that uh, they don't have uh, the rights that they should and, and rightly so. So I think this just came out yesterday in the Washington Post. Climate change is also a racial justice problem. Dealing with the pandemic brings uh, up these issues too. And so I thought I might just step back and talk about um, a, a couple of areas of intersection that might uh, be unexpected for attorneys. And specifically, I wanted to talk about land use and land use battles and land use development, um, because I actually really think that the way that we treat land use affects all of these issues, equity and climate, and that we have a moment right now uh, as we emerge from this pandemic or as we start to emerge or maybe <laughs> continue to descend, I don't know, uh, you know where the statistics are going, but as we're dealing with this pandemic, I think uh, land use planners, uh, other advocates are viewing this as a moment to really rethink how we settle our communities. When it comes to climate, how we settle our communities, what things are close to each other, whether we're developing densely or in a sprawling manner, all of these things to how much energy we use and, and our, the impact of humans on the environment. So just looking at this local and state question, I wanted to bring you to Hartford, Connecticut, which uh, as Lisa mentioned, where I chair the Planning and Zoning Commission. This is a picture of our nice riverfront. Um, this is a picture of our Planning and Zoning Commission and staff. So Hartford is a city, uh, a post-industrial city that is 85% uh, people of color, including myself, a Mexican-American, and just 15% uh, white, non-Latino. It's also a very poor city, and it has struggled with many of the issues that post-industrial cities have struggled with across the country. So it, Hartford, in, in some ways, 125,000 people is a, is a microcosm for what might be for central cities around the country if they start to grapple with the issues of climate, land use, um, equity, and so on. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we're doing here in Hartford and also in the rest of the state uh, to kind of grapple with these issues. So about four years ago, we did a sweeping overhaul of the zoning code. And in doing that, we engaged uh, hundreds of people within our community, lots of different stakeholders, business owners, small business owners, the environmentalists, um, the uh, local neighborhood associations, and really uh, through the zoning process, tried to figure out what does this community wanna be? And in a lot of ways you might've thought, well, people are not interested in zoning or people not, are not interested in land use. But once you explain to them, you know, what is the power of zoning to shape the way your community is built and to, to, to influence whether you're next to a landfill, which we have in Hartford, despite only being 18 square miles, or a trash to energy plant, which we have in Hartford, despite only being 18 square miles, and, and you know so many environmental justice issues that that raises. It was through that overhaul, and it was unanimous in one night, by the way, um, uh, we enabled and unlocked a forward-looking environmental approach toward our community that was really community-driven. And the zoning code is now set the rules for a community. Now, what does this have to do with climate? In the zoning code itself, and you know, not, not enough time to go through each of these, but in the zoning code itself, we tackled a number of issues that relate to climate change and um, really environmental health as a whole. 
So energy usage and, and trying to figure out, okay, is this community ready to enable solar and wind everywhere to require electric vehicle charging stations uh, in the transportation area? Are we ready to get rid of minimum parking requirements completely? Are we ready to put in waterway buffers to protect our, our, our waterways? Um, are we ready to completely unleash uh, urban food systems? And I guess I'll just give you the answer to all of that. The answer was yes, uh, once we, engage people in this self determinate self -deter process of self-determination and process of really shaping their zoning code they said yes to all of this because i think people here in hartford in a fairly low income fairly um diversity see these land use development issues as being very intertwined with a healthier environment with their public health long-term long public health um, and actually with economic factors too after that that we developed a climate action plan and again robust engagement uh, across the community focusing on economic development public health and social equity each of the action items within the climate plan at deep to one two or three of these issues very squarely and again that process enabled us to set a, a path for the future that we've used to raise millions of dollars start a city a sustainability office work with art organizations um, and really soar in this area and something that might be unexpected from a local local government like Hartford. Kind of last in this local government list of, of sort of things that we've done is, is our city plan, which was just adopted a few weeks ago. That too, 2,300 people in a city of 125,000 people uh, engage with this plan. Stakeholders of all different um, ages, races. Uh, we had seventh graders. We went to both senior centers. Um, we really got, I think, a, a very robust idea about where the people in the city wanted to go for our long-term planning. And, and a fifth of that plan is devoted to the environment. Uh, and a fifth of that plan is devoted to sustainable multimodal transportation systems. So if you think about the role of attorneys in, in climate change, I mean, I think a lot of what you'll hear today is really looking at the big picture and and, and major federal uh, le legislation or litigation uh, go working through the courts. But I would just encourage people to, to, to look really locally and also think, you know, what can I do on the local level? And what is the role of an attorney? In this case, you know, my role was to really help everybody synthesize uh, what they wanted into, into law and into, into uh, statements uh, of, of priorities. Um, just on the statewide level too, looking at uh, an issue that we're seeing here uh, related to climate, COVID, and the racial uh, equity uh, issues that, that are emerging um, is another issue, and it really relates to housing. So uh, we've seen cities and towns across the state declare that there's a public health crisis in racism. Uh, so we're not even talking, we're, we're post-COVID here in Connecticut. Our numbers are are, are going down thanks to great state policies. Um, so we're really thinking, you know, what, what are our public health crises? So we're still wearing masks, doing everything we need to do there, but, but looking forward, racism we're really seeing is an actually a public health crisis. So right now there's a special session that may be declared this month to address some of the issues of police accountability and uh, mail-in voting and things like that. But advocates, including myself, are pushing for housing and zoning reform on the legislative agenda. This just came out yesterday and it said, we're team on, are we gonna do critical housing segregation? Uh, a group of advocates has gotten together to work on this, desegregatect.org in case anybody's interested. Um, and what we're seeing there is actually that some of the main barriers to affordable housing in the state of Connecticut are uh, environmental in nature. So uh, things like septic systems and how big they can be, whether they can be alternative septic systems, where they can be placed. Uh, things like environmental interventions are our uh, environmental uh, policy, our statewide environmental policy act. This just happens to be a hearing in Mystic uh, on a zoning issue um, and, and, and public hearings. In addition, parking. So uh, we're seeing that the requirement that we overpave our cities and by having minimum parking requirements for zoning is something that could be addressed at the statewide level too. It would have uh, equity concerns. It would have it would it would address equity concerns because it would make it less expensive to develop affordable housing. At the same time, it would be beneficial to the environment. I'm big on minimum parking. Uh, if anybody wants to talk about that in the Q and A. So I just wanted to raise the, the local and state issues as, a, as just a very high level uh, couple of examples as to how climate 
uh, law can extend to the local level, can extend to the state level, and that often the solutions or the, the even people talking about their own solutions and, and devising their own solutions are very much uh, or can be very much one and the same with environmental justice and, and helping us move forward economically. Just quickly back to the article, I think I have two minutes. Um, it is online, uh, you know, for those who may want to check it out again, it's called What the Pandemic Can Teach Climate Attorneys. Um, the two questions I ask are really why courts, why do we talk, why are court, might courts be important to watch and uh, what lawsuits specifically should we be watching? And there are three categories I talk about in that article. So this is back putting my law professor hat on rather than my advocate hat on. Um, the failure to protect type lawsuits where, where plaintiffs are alleging in the coronavirus crisis that uh, government officials failed to protect them. So whether it's uh, imprisoned persons or incarcerated individuals or um, institutionalized individuals, there's a whole slew of lawsuits about this, somewhat reminiscent of the Juliana case. There's also misinformation lawsuits out there uh, against uh, media entities like Fox News for failing to provide accurate information about coronavirus. Well, the climate attorneys out there know that half of the battle is the message and the, the amount of misinformation about climate has been pretty uh, dramatic over time. And then finally, the slew of cases about takings, essentially small business owners saying that government shutdowns of their businesses uh, constitutes a taking, an unlawful taking. Now, we don't think those were likely to be successful in, in even uh, in the coronavirus case, uh, but if they were, climate attorneys should be really uh, worried. So again, very uh, quick summary of that article. Just to summarize and say, COVID presents a really big opportunity. And I would say, in addition to looking at scholarship about the courts and even uh, federal legislation, I would encourage attorneys on this call to think about local state uh, opportunities at the nexus of COVID climate and equity. So thank you very much. I'm on Twitter, if uh, if you guys are, and would love to, to engage with you there in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That was um, fascinating and very timely. Uh, so you didn't require two minute warning, so thank you. Um, next up, we have uh, Tracy Roberts. Uh, Tracy Roberts teaches tax, environmental law, and real property at Stanford University, the Cumberland School of Law in Birmingham, Alabama. She received her AB from Harvard, her JD from Vanderbilt, and her LLM in taxation from NYU. She's published articles on tax and the environment in the Northwestern Law Review, the Columbia Journal of Environmental Law, the Columbia Journal of Tax Law, and the Ecology Law Quarterly. Her book, Tax Law and the Environment, published in 2018, is now available in paperback. Tracy, over to you. Thank you, Lisa. And thanks to the um, ABA section on civil rights and social justice for organizing this meeting. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the common economics and the regulatory um, responses, the regulatory lessons um, from our responses to COVID-19 and climate change. Um, basically, I'm going to talk about, um, first, about the risk management challenges um, that are common to both crises. I'll talk about the legislative and administrative failures that we've seen from both problems and um, lessons that we can learn from the covid 19 emergency response. Second, I want to talk about the free rider and externality problems that are common to both crises and um, possible long-term regulatory responses that we can take. Uh, the Trump administration has been dismantling much of the existing regulatory system and therefore in restoring regulation, there are a number of tactics that we can borrow from their playbook. In addition, there have been, um, there's been a lot of energy around uh, the Green New Deal and deep decarbonization efforts. So these efforts are going to face some legislative roadblocks. So I'm going to talk also about budget reconciliation and the carbon tax as uh, providing uh, an avenue for success. The first challenge uh, relates to risk management. Uh, one of the uh, problems uh, with uh, managing risk is that we've got uh, fat-tailed distribution. Uh, this is a catchphrase that describes um, the notion that events that are expected to occur rarely are actually going to occur more frequently. We can't look to historical averages to predict future losses. The second problem is correlated risks. Um, this is when one risk uh, 
causes another risk or two or more risks uh, stem from a latent common cause. And then finally, we have tail dependence. Um, there's a likelihood that bad outcomes will occur together. So with both uh, COVID and with um, climate change, we've, we see probably each of these problems occurring inside of our risk management and our risk assessment processes. Uh, the risk and spread of zoonotic diseases increase with loss of habitat and changing ecosystems. In addition, old cultural and economic systems have combined with new wealth and mobility to uh, increase the spread of these diseases. Um, these are uh, problems with COVID. Uh, with climate change, um, we're, we see uh, rapidly changing ecosystems and possible large scale uh, discontinuities increasing the frequency of severe effects. We also have correlated risks for COVID-19. Uh, pandemic health risks lead to quarantine and quarantine uh, may lead to a number of economic risks. Um, we also see with climate change that there's a correlation between natural disaster losses of human life and uh, losses of property. And we note that securitization to aggregate and spread correlated risks can exacerbate um, the likelihood of insurance failure. Um, finally, we have tail dependence inside of COVID-19. Pandemic health risks may lead to quarantine and quarantine leading to economic risks uh, from business closures, dependence on web-based work and uh, mail-based delivery systems um, and their personnel um, can uh, lead to uh, further health risks. So you've got a feedback mechanism. Uh, furthermore, uh, with climate change, uh, natural disasters lead to evacuations, and as we've seen in Katrina, evacuations have reduced the personnel needed to respond to the natural disasters. In addition, we've seen a number of common legislative failures to these, um, uh, to these two different crises. Uh, the COVID-19 response, we saw uh, there was planning and preparation by prior administrations, but the current administration disregarded the National Security Council's plan and eschewed uh, pandemic, pandemic exercises. Um, in terms of transparency and accountability, we've seen cronyism, possible self-dealing, price gouging, uh, lack of coordination. Um, in terms of capacity building, instead of building capacity, the current administration has terminated experts and teams. Uh, there's been a problem, a long-term problem with maintaining stockpiles for needed supplies. Um, there have been problems with the supply chain network that result from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We have inter inexperienced intermediaries that have impeded delivery of, of supplies. Um, in terms of coordination and cooperation, federal and state governments, instead of cooperating and, and collaborating, have competed, and cooperation with the federal government was conditioned. Um, finally, um, with regard to coordination and cooperation, uh, the United States has withdrawn um, from a, a variety of international bodies and um, has threatened or has promised to defund the World Health Organization. In terms of norms and communications, we've got uh, confused messaging, misinformation, science denial, uh, promotion of anti-social norms. Many of these problems we've also seen inside of our um, existing uh, regulatory regime and responses with respect to climate change. Uh, we saw this administration withdraw the clean power plan and substitute pro-fossil fuel regulations. Uh, we've also seen some cronyism, several different people who were heading the EPA and other uh, relevant agencies have been um, asked to leave after uh, discovery of some problems with self-dealing. There have been secret meetings with industry. Um, not, and uh, in terms of um, building capacity, um, instead of building capacity, several different administrative agencies have been moved, removed to remote locations to, um, to uh, undermine the um, experts that are living in, uh, say, Washington, D.C., um, and possibly make way for the hiring of political allies. Um, in terms of coordination and cooperation, we've withdrawn from the Paris Accord or the Paris Agreement. Um, and then uh, federal government has impeded state engagement on a number of levels.
Um, in terms of communication and norms, again, we've seen science denial, misinformation, and promotion of antisocial norms as well. So the big administrative and legislative takeaways is that uh, we need to plan, identify the ways that risks are connected and dependent, decouple and disaggregate those risks, develop new models to estimate losses. We need to re prepare by redesigning and testing systems. We need to add redundancy to improve resilience. Um, in terms of building, we want to maintain and uh, develop uh, infrastructure, um, adaptive response systems, supply chains, and communication networks. We want to develop um, social capacity and increase administrative competency and norms to coordinate, cooperate, and collaborate at the international, national, state, and local levels. And then finally, we need to um, provide society with clear, clear messaging and support around community-based responses. Uh, finally, we need to mandate accountability and trans transparency. This is important for the trust needed in order to move forward. The second thing that I want to talk about is the, um, uh, the uh, economic characterizations of, of goods. So con I see global health, global public health, and the global atmosphere as common pool resources. Um, they are subtractive or rival goods. This means that um, they um, diminish with use and use by one person or some persons um, may lead to the, the value of that uh, common good being uh, reduced for everyone. Um, they're also um, non-excludable because it's difficult to draw boundaries around them and to prevent overuse or misuse. This leads to several, a couple of problems. We've got a free rider problem and an externality problem. Um, free riders, um, individuals pursuing their own short-term self-interest will take actions that diminish the value of the resource to all without paying for their share of that resource or paying for the diminution of value. Um, in addition, we've um, these individuals, in taking those self-interested actions, um, they have these harmful spillover effects to other individuals or other individuals' use of that resource. So two ways of saying similar things. So with COVID-19, uh, obviously failure to wear a mask, social distance, take these kinds of actions increases risks to others and spreads contagion. Uh, likewise, with climate change, our use of goods and services that were generated, manufactured, or distributed using fossil fuels raises the stock of CO2 in the atmosphere and exacerbates the effects um, and the risks of ir irreversible climate change. Now, there are a series of common law solutions to externality problems. We have liability rules. Um, the, the risks can be allocated to the actors or to third parties, but the liability rules are uh, face a number of problems. First, in terms of climate change, there's issues with causation. Um, and then also, as I mentioned before, there are insurance problems with regard to the kinds of risks that we're seeing. Um, we also have property rules. So potentially we can allocate property rights and have the individuals trade their entitlements. Um, there are some limits to the use of the property rules. We've got assignment problems. Um, who gets the property right and who has to pay? Um, transaction costs. How do we get everyone together to allow them to make those trades? We've got collective action problems. Uh, we've got another set of free rider problems and the possibility that, that we have holdouts. Um, and finally, we've got distributional impacts from any kind of change in the allocation of rights under the common law. So a regulatory solution is, is preferred. So command and control uh, regulation, uh, control of quantities, the government can ban um, uh, fossil fuels, uh, the government can require people to use uh, new fuels, uh, the government can cap, which is often what we're currently doing, that's what the Clean Power Plan anticipated, capping CO2 uh, production or uh, mandate minimums. Uh, we can see uh, renewable uh, fuel standards being mandatory minimums. Um, we can also respond with market incentives. Uh, the government can fine people for producing uh, CO2. The government can supply alternative um, 
mechanisms so that people don't need to use fossil fuels. The government can tax or the government can subsidize those activities. Um, now, the problems with a new regulatory responses is that we have a real severe lack of bipartisanship and any proposal may be subject to Senate filibuster. Um, there have also been problems with uh, existing regulation being dismantled. Um, and we can take some lessons away from this. For instance, um, the Trump administration used executive orders to reverse changes, uh, to, um, uh, to make changes to agency practices, and we can reverse those using uh, executive orders. Um, we can withdraw and replace the pro-fossil fuel regulations that the Trump administration has put in place. Um, and uh, just as they withdrew uh, the uh, clean power plan. In terms of regulatory, or sorry, legislative branch responses, um, the Senate has used the Congressional Review Act to reverse, un, uh, to reverse uh, pro-climate um, rules. And so it can also be used to reverse pro-fossil fuel rules. Um, there is, um, we can reverse the plan to remove the agency offices to Grand Junction and to Kansas City um, and rehire the existing expertise. Um, in addition, we can use uh, the budget reconciliation process to uh, pass revenue and spending legislation. And this is one way of sidestepping the Senate filibuster. Two more minutes, Tracy. Okay. So, um, the Senate filibuster uses minority. Um, the, the Senate minority uses the filibuster to block legislation, and it takes 60 votes to override the filibuster. Um, now, potentially, a new Senate could end the filibuster, but a, a possibly more um, attractive response is to use the bu budget reconciliation alternative. Um, this process is not subject to the filibuster, but it does have some limitations. Uh, provisions that do not pr produce a change in outlays of spending or revenues, which are taxes, may be uh, removed from the legislation if a senator calls for a point of order. Um, and then uh, there is also a limit about budget deficit increases. Um, based on the Congressional Budgets Office's uh, cost estimates, Legislation that increases the budget deficit beyond the 10 year budget window must be changed and meet the deficit requirements in the budget resolution. So when we look at recent uh, estimates of the deficit as a share of the uh, gross domestic product, it's very high. Um, if we look at the share of the federal debt as a share of GDP, it's also very high. And then if we look at the uh, post-crisis percentages those are increased substantially. Just for 2020, instead of having a $1.1 billion deficit between our revenues and our expenses, uh, one, we're gonna have a $3.7 trillion uh, deficit. These all add up to add to the federal debt so that we can see by 2050, there's just a substantial um, federal debt increase. As a result, the carbon tax is a natural fit. It's a regulatory, it can be used as regulatory tax, taxation. It is a tax. It, it falls within the bird rule and it's completely germane to spending and taxes. In addition, um, it will produce income. It will produce revenue. And so if we want to try to employ some of the spending identified in the Green New Deal and with the deep decarbonization initiatives, we will have funds to do that. Thank you. Uh, great, Tracy. Thank you very much um, for your presentation. So uh, next, we're going to move on to um, Mike Gerard. Uh, Michael Gerard is a professor at Columbia Law School, where he teaches courses in environmental and energy law, and founded and directs the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law. He's also a member and former chair of the faculty of Columbia's Earth Institute, before moving into academia in 2009, he practiced environmental law full-time in New York City for 30 years, and most recently as a partner in charge of the New York office of Arnold and Porter. He's written or edited 13 books on environmental law. Thank you very much, Lisa. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, as Judy Perry Martinez, the president of the American Bar Association said at the beginning of this program, 
the ABA has called upon lawyers around the country to uh, work on pro bono projects to fight climate change. Now, many of the uh, pro bono matters that we hear about concern litigation, but litigation is also difficult for some lawyers and some lawyers have conflicts. I wanna talk about a kind of pro bono work that does not involve litigation that instead involves legislative drafting and advocacy, some of it at the federal level and some of it as uh, Sarah protect, uh, uh, suggested a few minutes ago at the state and local levels. Uh, it starts with a project that uh, was done about eight years ago uh, in conjunction with the United Nations, the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project, which for 16 major economies came up with pathways for how each of those countries could greatly reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. One of the volumes that was produced by that project uh, was pathways to deep decarbonization in the United States. And it rested on four pillars. Um, uh, in order to achieve net zero or net negative emissions of greenhouse gases, which is where we need to be headed. Uh, first, we have decarbonization of the electricity supply, uh, completely eliminating the use of coal for electricity. Uh, almost no oil is used for electricity anymore uh, and greatly reducing the use of natural gas. Uh, and instead having renewables and possibly nuclear. The second pillar is energy efficiency. Uh, reducing by 40% the per capita final energy demand. The third pillar is electrification, moving uh, many of the uh, current uses of liquid fuels uh, to electricity led by transport. So virtually all of the, uh, the new passenger cars would have to be electric. Um, uh, heavy duty vehicles like trucks, uh, uh, might have to use uh, hydrogen-based uh, 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 fuels. A lot of home heating and cooking would be changed to electricity. And the fourth pillar is carbon capture, capturing uh, the carbon coming out of mostly industrial processes before it goes into the atmosphere, and also removing some of the carbon dioxide uh, that is now in the atmosphere. There are various scenarios for how that would be done, but let's just take uh, a, a mixed scenario and you see out to 2050, uh, you see a tremendous decline in, uh, in emissions uh, resulting from the sense of the elimination of coal, the virtual elimination of uh, diesel and gasoline and the replacement by electric vehicles, uh, uh, increase in, um, in renewables. So this, these are the technical pathways. Another law professor, John Dernbach of Widener Law School, and I then got together and asked the question, how does US law need to change in order for uh, the US to be on these pathways? Uh, we enlisted about 50 lawyers all on a pro bono basis, mostly law professors, some practitioners, and some in NGOs uh, to think about how the laws should change. And the result uh, was this book that was published a little over a year ago by the Environmental Law Institute, Legal Pathways to Deep Decarbonization in the United States, now available on Amazon for about $65, uh, setting forth uh, in enormous detail, it's a book of about 1200 pages, uh, what the current law is and how it needs to be changed to be on these pathways. Uh, we also put out this abridged volume, uh, which is available online for free as a, as a PDF. Um, Tracy just walked us through a number of the kinds of legal techniques that can be used. And here the, uh, the book utilizes 12 different types of legal techniques. We of course do have additional regulations in there, but we have a lot of other legal techniques that can help achieve these objectives, uh, including uh, market-based approaches like carbon price, removal of incentives for fossil fuel use, insurance, lots of other techniques are available. So the book is divided into several parts. Uh, each of these bullets represents a chapter. Each chapter goes through the existing law and how it needs to be changed. So we have uh, chapters on light duty vehicles, heavy duty vehicles and freight, transportation demand and mode shifting, 
aviation, shipping, lighting, appliances, and other equipment, old buildings, new buildings, and the industrial sector. We have chapters on decarbonization of the electricity supply, utility scale renewables like large scale wind and utility scale solar, distributed renewables such as rooftop solar, uh, the transmission distribution and storage that, uh, is, that will be needed for all of it, uh, maintaining uh, some of the existing nuclear fleet, hydropower, and ways to phase out fossil fuels in the electricity sector. Uh, one thing I need to point out is that uh, if we are going to uh, move to electricity for transport and for a lot of building, heating, and cooling, we're going to need a whole lot more electricity, even after tremendous energy efficiency improvements. Uh, so uh, we will need to replace uh, almost all of the existing fossil fuel generation we have now with renewables and build a whole lot more with renewables uh, to uh, provide the additional electricity we need for vehicles and buildings. Uh, some liquid fuels will still be necessary for things like aviation and, 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 and possibly uh, freight and uh, and, and, and shipping and uh, to be as uh, low carbon as possible. A lot of that will have to come from bioenergy. We also need to capture the CO2 that is nonetheless going to escape into the atmosphere that would otherwise escape into the atmosphere from processes that are difficult to control, such as uh, a number of industrial processes and any remaining fossil fuel facilities. We need to withdraw a great deal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. We've already put too much there. We need to draw some of it down and there are a number of technologies under development that could do that. There's a great deal that could be done with the agriculture sector. Right now, the agriculture sector is a net emitter of, of greenhouse gases through various changes, mostly in soil management. It can become a, a sink for um, greenhouse gas emissions. And there is uh, a potential for forestry for different methods of forest management to um, also capture more CO2 from the atmosphere. There are a number of carbon of climate pollutants other than carbon dioxide that also need to be controlled because they are significant contributors to uh, climate change, black carbon, methane fluorinated gases and nitrous oxide. And there are legal techniques that could be used in order to uh, try to reduce the emissions of all of these substances. Uh, then we talk about uh, cross-cutting approaches, uh, carbon pricing, uh, Tracy has talked about, uh, technological innovation, financing issues, materials consumption, and changes in international trade. So that's, a, that's what the book has to say, but we don't want the book just to lie on the shelf. Uh, we, we need to get it implemented. And, and so there are a couple of projects we have that involve a lot of pro bono help to try to implement the recommendations. Uh, the first is to draft the model laws that are recommended by the book. And so uh, um, Richard Horsch, who recently retired as an environmental partner in the law firm of White and Case, has volunteered to lead the project of mobilizing pro bono lawyers to draft these model laws. So far, we have about 24 big law firms that are at work in drafting these model laws. We need more, not just big law firms, small law firms, individuals. We need more to draft the large numbers of model laws. Uh, we are also um, subjecting each of these model laws to peer review uh, because we, we want them to be of, of high quality. Uh, we also um, set up something called the Renewable Energy Legal Defense Initiative, which provides pro bono legal help to community groups and others that want renewables in their communities, but that are facing local opposition. We could use more pro bono help with that. We created a website, the Model Laws for deep decarbonization um, uh, website, uh, which, let me see if I can slide this over, um, on which we've already posted about 1,800 
uh, resources, all the model laws that we have drafted, plus lots of other uh, laws that, uh, uh, that already uh, exist. And it is a, a resource that can be uh, used by people in every uh, state and uh, municipality, as well as at the federal level, uh, in order to uh, find uh, laws that uh, they might be able to uh, to adopt for their own purposes. And so we have more than 1800 laws here, as I say, and, uh, and many more on the way. Uh, so we need lawyers, pro bono lawyers to draft these model laws. We need pro bono lawyers to peer review the model laws. We need pro bono lawyers, and this is the largest number of them we need, to promote these model laws. Uh, in, in, in Congress, you know, uh, just today, the House Select Committee on the Climate, Climate Crisis released a massive package of proposals. There are, there are other proposals uh, that we'll hear more about uh, from the next speaker, but a great deal can and needs to be done at the state level and at city and town levels. And so we need lawyers to be out there and, and looking at the model laws and the actual laws we have and getting out to uh, uh, these legislatures at every level to try to get them actually adopted. And finally, um, we need to defend the, the, the construction of renewables and the associated transmission and storage. In order to achieve these objectives, in order to uh, uh, shut down the existing fossil fuel electricity generating we have, and move away from fossil fuel fired vehicles and so forth, we need to build a very large number of new renewable energy facilities. There's just no way around that. Um, this often faces local opposition and we need people to support uh, these projects, both uh, you know, at the administrative and, and, and legislative level and also in court. So the final slide I have, and we'll make all these slides available, has uh, uh, contact uh, information for the people who are relevant and anybody who uh, might be interested in getting involved in any of these projects. You have the information for myself and my co-editor, John Dernbach, Richard Horsch, who is the lawyer who is heading up our effort to recruit pro bono lawyers to do all this drafting, and Marcy Kahn, a retired justice of the New York Supreme Court Appellate Division, who is leading our efforts to um, uh, get to peer review all of these uh, model laws and make sure they are of uh, high quality. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Mike. So a lot of work to do. <laughs> um, so we had a very quick question um, for who to contact to assist in drafting and review. So the, the slide you put up um, uh, at the end is an appropriate context for people. Uh, yes, and we'll make these slides available to anyone who wants them. Great, thank you. Um, I also would like to remind um, participants to uh, put your questions in the Q&A. We have a couple uh, coming in. And next we're going to move on to um, Adam Zipkin, who currently serves as counsel to the United States Senator Cory Booker. In this role, Adam advises Senator Booker on issues related to the environment, energy, agriculture, and animal welfare. Before his employment in the Senate, Adam was deputy mayor for economic development for the city of Newark in New Jersey. Prior to working in city hall, Adam operated a law office primarily devoted to providing pro bono legal services to Newark residents in need with a focus on providing representation to low income tenants. Over to you, Adam. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you um, to the ABA for inviting me to participate in this important um, webinar and uh, starting with the point of sort of the connection between coronavirus and climate change and the potential for transformative climate change legislation, I think, you know, it, it was mentioned before that the coronavirus is both a crisis and an opportunity. And I think from a climate change perspective, that is very, very true. You know, we have advocates for whether you want to call it a Green New Deal or just, you know, for taking really bold action on climate change that's in line with what the scientists are telling us we need to do, you know, to avoid the worst impacts of climate change and stay not only below two degrees Celsius increase, but hopefully, you know, below 1.5 degrees. 
you know, you had this push for a Green New Deal, but you didn't really have the economic conditions in our country where a new deal, so to speak, is what we needed. And actually what the coronavirus has wrought is now we actually need a new deal type of economic stimulus that fits perfectly with the potential for big climate change legislation. And so I think that heading into 2021, it's seeming to me like the Democrats are really aligned on want, wanting to do something on climate change at the scale that's necessary. And, you know, look, we've passed now trillions of dollars of, um, of legislation here in DC to deal with COVID. And we're recognizing the reality that we're going to need trillions more. And so I think there's now an alignment and, and a, an opportunity for really transformative climate legislation to pass in DC next year, obviously depending on what the landscape is in DC after November. Um, and, and I think that the comments that were made earlier about how that could happen were exactly right. At the end of the day, the way that a climate change bill will pass the Senate next year, um, you know, most likely would have to be by using budget reconciliation, which means that it can be a bill that does direct spending at pr pretty much unlimited levels for, for at least 10 years, that does all kinds of tax code changes. And what it really can't do is just make policy changes. And so to the extent that something does not have a budgetary impact directly, but is more just if you wanted to amend the Clean Air Act, or if you wanted to create a federal renewable portfolio standard or something like that, those are the types of things that are not well suited and probably not in order for a budget reconciliation climate change bill. But that said, from my having focused on this now for multiple years, I think that within the what a budget reconciliation bill would allow, we could do enough from a climate change perspective to, to put ourselves on the trajectory that we wanna put ourselves. And so I think both on the tax side, which is potentially you know, the um, opportunity to put some type of price on carbon through a carbon tax and dividend or however that might be structured, the ability to do that is clearly within the framework and making other changes to the tax code. So removing, you know, um, subsidies that currently exist for um, fossil fuel companies or other uh, industries that are contributing to the climate change problem and contributing to carbon emissions versus also the ability to extend and modify and enhance tax credits for solar and wind and energy storage and other renewables. So all of that is on the table on the tax side. And then from a spending perspective, you know, the whole, what was great about the Green New Deal sort of um, idea and sort of burst of enthusiasm and energy, it seems like so long ago, but I guess was a year or so ago, um, was that it kind of shifted the conversation in Washington, at least, away from um, so much focus on putting a price on carbon or doing cap and trade, you know, I, which I still think um, is an important piece to the puzzle, but it expanded it to this idea of making really large scale direct federal investments and using federal spending through a New Deal type lens to accomplish climate change goals. And so I think that anything that would be within that spending lens, um, we could be done through a budget reconciliation bill. And so I think um, focusing on incentives for clean electricity and for um, electrifying the transportation sector and all the different ways you might try to do that just with direct federal investment, whether it's literally building out infrastructure or creating tax incentives or direct grants for um, local governments or states or uh, private individuals to make these types of transformations. It, it's all potentially possible. And um, I think what, what will be very quickly 
you know, an agenda item in Washington in November, in, in post November and in, you know, January, in early 2021, if the stars are aligned. Um, I want to talk about a couple of the bills that Senator Booker has focused on that are climate change related that, you know, the, um, some of the focus on decarbonizing electricity and electrifying transportation and all those things, there's a lot of legislation and a lot of thought that has gone into it and a lot of, um, I think, potential bills that could be taken as well as like, uh, as was mentioned, the House came out today, the House Select Committee with their proposed climate change plan. And so I think there's um, a lot there to work from and to pull from that could all pass both the House and the Senate potentially. Senator Booker in this space has focused um, a lot of energy on environmental justice and on natural climate solutions. And so environmental justice, the Senator has introduced legislation that would do a whole bunch of um, important things in terms of codifying executive orders that President Clinton and President Obama put in place to protect low-income communities, indigenous communities, communities of color. Um, it would overrule some Supreme Court precedent that has narrowed the scope of the Civil Rights Act and taken away some private causes of action where there's um, discriminatory impact, but not necessarily discriminatory intent that can be shown. Um, and it also would, um, this environmental justice legislation would require the EPA to consider cumulative impacts before granting new air pollution or water pollution permits. So right now, essentially, if you want to build a new garbage incinerator or whatever the source of um, pollution might be, really the analysis is in a vacuum, well, what's the, is it using best available technology essentially, right? Whereas what the question that they don't ask and the analysis that they don't do is, well, where we're proposing to build this facility, what's the air pollution levels already in that community and what's the potential impact on the health of local residents if we add another major source of air pollution into that, um, into that mix. And so, so the legislation would do that, but now a lot of those things that I just said would not be the types of direct spending or tax provisions that could go into a reconciliation bill. And so what could go into a reconciliation bill that's environmental justice focused, I think would be a historic investment to clean up legacy pollution. So you have Superfund sites and abandoned coal mines and hard rock mines and other types of mines. You have former Department of Defense contaminated properties. You have lead service lines throughout the country, you, you know, into drinking water. You have um, lead, other sources of lead in, in housing. You have households in the United States that don't have complete plumbing. And so it's an environmental justice issue where you have literally hundreds of thousands of households that don't have a wastewater disposal system. So they're not connected to a sewer and they don't have a septic. And you have households in the US that are literally straight piping waste out to their backyards. And, and you see that in the black belt, you see that in, in various parts of our country in, again, low income communities, communities of color, indigenous communities. And what you have in some of those communities is the scientists are starting to find neglected tropical diseases that we didn't even think we still had in the United States, like hookworm in these areas because we have untreated waste just being, you know, piped out into these, um, into these areas. And so, so that is something, you know, taking some percentage of a trillion dollar or whatever the investment is going to be and taking, you know, 50 billion or a hundred billion or whatever the right number is to clean up all of that legacy pollution. First of all, it's something that in, if we want these communities to thrive, the communities that we're seeing hardest hit by COVID, low-income communities, communities of color, indigenous communities, if we want them to thrive in the future, we have to clean up this legacy pollution that is impacting their health and creating underlying medical conditions that make them more susceptible to both you know, getting COVID and the seriousness of COVID and the death 
toll of COVID. Um, and so I think that is a potential big part that Senator Booker will be pushing into the climate change conversation along with others. And I will say that over the last couple of years, this idea of environmental justice and you know the um, House Select Committee report that came out today, pretty much any plan that you're seeing now from the various candidates on the campaign trail, environmental justice is to greater and lesser extent a focus of everyone that's talking about addressing climate change, which is great. Um, and, and then the other bill that Senator Booker introduced with the idea that Democrats are really using this year to put out their ideas and socialize them and get feedback on them of like what are important pieces of a big climate change bill in 2021, it, you know, so that we're not coming in next year and starting from scratch, right? Like we have now all this legislation, the House report, and that will be a blueprint for what we could do. Senator Booker introduced a bill last September called the Climate Stewardship Act that is focused on natural climate solutions. And so these natural climate solutions today in the US, our forests, our wetlands, our soils absorb something 10, 11, 12% of all carbon emissions, you know, that is in the US from all sources. So from cars and trucks and coal plants, more than 10% of it is currently absorbed and sequestered from these sources. But there's the potential, scientists in the last few years have come out with reports showing that with the right investments, we could substantially increase the amount of carbon that we're sequestering in these forests and wetlands and in our soils. And so the bill would, and by the way, the original New Deal, they planted 3 billion trees. And so, so the bill that Senator Booker introduced, we would plant 4 billion trees by 2030 and over 15 billion trees by 2050. We would uh, restore millions of acres of coastal wetlands. And then we would use voluntary existing USDA conservation programs and you know, 10 times the funding in some instances to those programs but not just putting money into the programs writ large, but for a subset of the practices that the scientists are telling us are beneficial from a climate change perspective that either reduce emissions from the agricultural sector or that more often increase soil carbon sequestration and really can go from making the agricultural sector, which today in the US is nine or 10% of total emissions in the US come from the ag sector. It's a part of the problem, we could make the agriculture sector a part of the solution by incentivizing these practices like planting cover crops and, and using less fertilizer and engaging in rotational grazing. And there's a whole, you know, silvopasture, planting trees out in with the um, growing of crops and, and, and grazing livestock. And so for both, you know, going back for a second to the environmental justice cleanup of the legacy pollution, it's also climate change mitigation, right? Because, or it's climate change adaptation, right? So there's a big focus on mitigation, rightly so. We have to, on a trajectory, you know, get to quickly decarbonizing and, and stopping emitting, but we also need adaptation. And both of these bills would do both because the environmental justice cleaning up all this legacy pollution right now, as we're seeing more extreme weather, and we're seeing more flooding, you're seeing now these low income communities, indigenous communities, communities of color, the Superfund sites are flooding, right? Now you have neighboring properties and additional people being exposed to all this contamination and all this pollution. And with the natural climate solutions, so just the reforestation. Two more minutes, Adam. How much? Two more minutes. Okay, so the, the reforestation alone, the trees that we would plant in the future decades would have the potential to sequester you know, millions and millions of tons of carbon. And the same with the, if we could really sort of change practices on a big level with our uh, farming practices, we could sequester a lot of carbon. But equally important by investing in those natural climate solutions, planting trees, farming differently, restoring coastal wetlands, you're preventing flooding, you're making farms and ranches and communities more resilient, you're protecting drinking water, right? All these, so it's mitigation, but it's also really important climate change adaptation. There are so many co-benefits 
and, and I'll close with this, going back to the connection to COVID, if we, if we restore forests, if we stop deforestation and we restore forests, not only is that beneficial from a climate change perspective, but we also reduce the risk of future pandemics because we know that these viruses, these zoonotic diseases are gonna be, their predictions are, they're gonna be more frequent the more that we keep destroying these natural ecosystems and, um, and, and encroaching on habitat and having more interaction between humans and wildlife that we historically would never have had. So I do think it, it ties all together well. And then last, 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 opportunities for lawyers. I think I agree with what everyone said and putting back on my local government hat coming from Newark, I think there's opportunities to work with these environmental justice stakeholders when you have a place like Cancer Alley in Louisiana that's already the cancer rates are through the roof, but you have new companies coming in proposing to build new petrochemical plants or new you know, types of sources of pollution. Those stakeholders in those communities, they're low income communities, communities of color, they don't have the resources to take on the deep pocketed interests that are proposing these projects. And so I think that is an area where trying to connect lawyers with those communities, they really need the help. So thank you. Okay, right, thank you, Adam, that's helpful. <laughs> so we have a number of questions. Um, I'm gonna try and bunch them. So Sarah, I have a question for you. Um, in relation to heat and health, um, is the focus more on human health for workers or the focus more on being able to grow agriculture? Where's the focus? Yeah, so the question of heat waves and, and a warming climate really affects both uh, humans and, and plants and I guess, and also animals, of course. So, uh, you know, when we were thinking about climate action in Hartford, we identified heat waves as being a particular concern for our vulnerable populations. So even in Connecticut, you still need air conditioners uh, during the summer as the climate warms. Um, so a lot of our families can't afford that and their homes are not made to be energy efficient. So going back to the, the kind of strategies that Michael was pointing out, there's a lot of different strategies that we can use to address those through the law. But one question is right now, what do we do uh, to help those families? So for me, the heat wave, the, the heat, the warming planet, uh, heat, heat wave issue uh, really does tie uh, very well into equity and uh, what our low income, low income populations can afford, literally afford to bear. That's great, thank you. And then a lot of uh, workers who work outside are also from low income communities of color. So that's great. So uh, Tracy, I have uh, lots of questions for you on Codeism. Uh, so the first two uh, are for you. One, is there an overlap in terms of political affiliation between cronyism um, instances you've identified between COVID and climate change? And the second question is on tax structures. So are there tax, um, there are currently tax incentives for overconsumption and bad land use, the examples of Proposition 13 in California. Is there a way to educate legislators to overturn those laws? Um, with regard to cronyism, um, with regard to uh, the cronyism that we've seen and has been reported in all the newspapers, we have the APA administrator and uh, various individuals within the Department of Interior. Um, they have relationships with energy incumbents. This is fossil fuel uh, investors, fossil fuel resource owners and um, investor operated utilities. So most of the subsidies that we're seeing and most of the um, engagement that we've seen behind the people who have since stepped down relates to um, those subsidies and those relationships. Um, COVID-19, the, the, the relationships that we've seen where we've seen uh, particular people who have no experience and no background uh, providing supplies um, in developing supply chains and responding to crisis, uh, crises, they are new entrants. They don't have a historic uh, relationship in terms of uh, with this, uh, er this er um, area of engagement. Um, now, the current administration is Republican, so they have in a, they're in a position to, um, to have those, uh, a potential patronage relationship, but um, Democrats are not without sin as a historical matter. So my proposal is that we incorporate in all of our legislation, we incorporate, uh, incorporate into um, ethics uh, standards, uh, some transparency and accountability to prevent this to happen, uh, keep from happening no matter who's in office. 
Um, with regard to the various subsidies that are littered throughout the tax code, uh, I, I've written a lot about those and so has Roberta Mann and so has um, uh, Janet Milne. And so all of, uh, all of these uh, problems with regard to the connection between land use and uh, the tax system, a lot of these have been written about. So there's a lot of material out there. Um, in terms of educating legislators, I suspect that most, certainly at the federal level, many of the legislators already know about this and they've actually been uh, buttonholed by people who want to see those uh, tax subsidies expanded. Uh, we have a tax expenditure budget at the federal level. Um, after Stanley Surrey began noting that these subsidies in the tax code are um, problematic, they're ever expansive, they increase every year, they're upside down. Um, after he identified that to Congress, Congress said, oh, wow, this is, this is a great little, uh, cubby hole for us to hide away all our, 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 our handouts. And so uh, one of the problems is that you really need a, a massive overhaul of the tax legislation. You need massive support um, on a grassroots level to make that happen. Um, and, uh, but in terms of, of, of advocating, my latest information uh, from California is that uh, people are feeling the pinch from Proposition 13, and there, en there are enough new people who have come to California that are, that are subject to high tax rates that they are ready to, to um, be active and overturn the, the interests of those who have been enjoying the, the low tax rates on their property because they were there uh, from the 1970s. So I think that this may be a moment where you'll be able to get rid of Proposition 13. Great, thank you, Tracy. I have one more question, which may sort of straddle you and Mike, and then the second question will move over to Mike. So the uh, question for potentially both of you is, what's the role of international investment law for deep decarbonization? And then Mike, the second question, which I'll uh, throw over to you is, what's the role of tort law to compensate people harmed by coronavirus or climate change exacerbated by cronyism? For example, um, populations living near a chemical plant in Houston. So first, with respect to international investment law, there are quite a few bilateral investment treaties between states, countries, um, and many of them say that a, a state may not impose, may not take actions that would hurt the investment. And so there's concern that some of these may be used to inhibit the enactment of anti-fossil fuel laws uh, by a country. There hasn't been a lot of that. There's some litigation now pending in Canada about restrictions on fracking. There's a little bit of that, but, but there is tremendous concern uh, that that may happen. And that was one of the issues uh, in the Trans-Pacific uh, Agreement of, of a few years ago. International trade law also has real concerns. It inhibits certain kinds of local subsidies for renewables. And, uh, had, and a number of these international trade doctrines have gotten in the way of the growth of uh, renewables. Before I get to your other question, Tracy, did you want to say anything more about the investment law question? Oh, no, I agree with you 100%. That was, um, that was one of the big op oppositions to passing or uh, agreeing to, to um, ratify the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, one of the, however, in terms of international um, engagement, one of the places where the WTO and other um, international agencies tend to turn a blind eye is to uh, tax uh, mechanisms of tax financing. So um, when we look at what's happened at, in terms of measures of, of subsidies for fossil fuels, um, in general, uh, those are, are, are overlooked because in the United States, they're primarily through the tax code. Um, however, when you look at, uh, at, at, at budgetary costs or, or, or um, budgetary provisions to provide subsidies, those are scrutinized heavily. So I suspect that if we uh, use a tax mechanism to try to achieve this, this may also sidestep some of these, um, some of these concerns under um, EU and, and other uh, other treaties that we have uh, with respect to uh, international investment. 
On the question about the role of tort law, uh, you know, this is a raging issue. There are about 15 tort suits that are pending around the United States, mostly brought by uh, uh, cities and counties against uh, energy companies. And right now, the focus of the litigation is whether they belong in federal court or state court. Uh, we've had uh, uh, a couple of appellate decisions for, from the Ninth Circuit of the Fourth Circuit saying that they can stay in, in state court. Um, uh, the decision coming out of a lawsuit brought by the city of Baltimore, where the Court of Appeals said it could stay in state court, which is where the plaintiffs want it. There's a cert petition uh, by the defendants before the Supreme Court. We'll see what happens with that. Now, these aren't based on, on cronyism. They're, they're based on the, the mostly the public nuisance theory. Two very recent suits have been filed just in the last week, one by the state of Minnesota, one by the District of Columbia. Um, claiming uh, deception by deception of consumers by energy companies. So we'll see what happens with that. I haven't seen much tort litigation uh, growing out of the uh, uh, pandemic. Um, there's a lot of contract litigation and many other things, but it may be that that'll come. Good. It's, causation is a, is a tougher issue with, with that. Thank you. I have one more question for you, Mike, and then I'll move over to Adam for a couple of agriculture based questions. So on relation to the model laws project, uh, the website, does it link to other, um, I think you mentioned 16 um, economies that were participating in the deep decarbonization. And the question is, you know, how do we scale these initiatives up to the global level, particularly in countries in the global south where there's limited uh, capacity? So is there an international coalition of lawyers that's happening, if it is happening to the UNFCCC? Irina, what kind of form? So uh, we, we have encouraged and are, and are seeing the launching of similar projects in some other parts of the world. Uh, there is a project uh, to come up with legal pathways to deep decarbonization in Brazil that has begun. There's another project in Europe, a Europe-wide project. There's another project in Australia. And we're working with all of those and would love for, for more of these. Uh, in terms of... Uh, Overall, the, the role of international law, I mean, of course, most emissions are domestic within a country and the laws on transboundary air pollution, we have international doctrines on that, but they are very weak and it's tough for a country to sue another country because of its emissions. The truly international emissions that we have are from aviation and shipping. And if they were added together, they would be about the fifth largest emitting country. Um, the uh, uh, Kyoto Protocol punted those to the International Civil Aviation Organization and the International Maritime Organization, which have been very slow and very weak. So control, international control of aviation and shipping emissions is something that is very important. I think the most important area for international law is in the area of mass migration. You know, the, the climate change that is happening is going to cause horrible, horrible mass migration and countries need to accept people who are migrating. They're not legally refugees, but this is going to be a massive problem, but that's four other webinars. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, um, Adam, I had a couple of questions uh, that hopefully you can uh, address. So the first is they're agriculture related. So the first is how do uh, generally panelists feel about um, increasing um, vertically integrated CAFOs, basically animal feeding operations and meat packing plants, where they're both high uh, emission uh, sites, but also super spreader in relation and employ a lot of uh, people from low income communities and communities of color. So, are there any other approaches to this issue besides tightening zoning uh, requirements? And the second question is how do we related, how do we diversify farming, particularly when a lot of farming operations are owned by large corporations? So thank you for those questions. So on the first question, the answer is a definite yes, and it could be its own webinar to talk about, you know, sort of COVID did not break our food system, but COVID has exposed how broken our food system is. And literally, we have a food system today, it's harmful, for the most part, to farmers and ranchers, it's harmful to rural communities, it's obviously terrible the way it treats animals, the way it treats workers, um, the environmental impacts and the impacts on rural communities. The, the one beneficiary of the current food system 
are these massive multinational corporations that have consolidated to such an incredible extent that you now have like four companies that control 85% of the beef market or something like that. And I mean, look, they're political. So this disproportionate economic power that they have has given them disproportionate political power. The fact that the president would not use the Defense Production Act to get more PPE to hospitals, but he used it to keep meat packing plants open despite the risks to workers. And by, by the way, primarily like, or in a big way, what we're seeing is that exports to China and other countries were at all time highs in the last couple of months. So this whole thing about like, oh, we need to feed people here in the US by you know keeping the um, food system that these big companies are really the ones that broke it and now they come asking for help and they got it. And so I think, so Senator Booker introduced a bill at the end of last year called the Farm System Reform Act and Senator Warren recently co-sponsored it and there was a house companion introduced and it would um, phase out large, it would put a moratorium on new large factory farms and it would phase them out completely by 2040. It would also make a whole bunch of fixes to our antitrust laws that, you know, a hundred years ago, we passed laws to keep these meat packers from getting so big. And then about 40 years ago, we stopped enforcing those laws. And now here we are. And so um, figuring out how to uh, create a more diffuse system and, and, and something that both the Natural Climate Solutions Bill I mentioned before, and also the uh, Food System Reform Act, we would invest heavily in programs that, and this will answer the second question, that provide incentives for local and regional food systems, right? So ultimately what we need to do is go back to a model that is just a smaller scale model and not with these massive you know, supply chains that grow across countries that we're now seeing the pandemic you know, uh, shine a light on how broken the current system is. And so I think there's a lot that we could do. And I think that what COVID by putting a light on the meatpacking plants and other parts of our food system, because by the way, the parts of our food system that have shown to be really resilient during the pandemic have been the small farmers who have switched to a direct to consumer and CSAs and, you know, switching from farmers markets and stuff. And so I think there's, this is something that Senator Booker will be super focused on in the months and years to come. And that I think hopefully, you know, can, can bring about change quicker than we might've thought because of, you know, the moment that we're in. That's great. So there's so many great questions. I didn't get to ask my questions to the panelists, but I did want to uh, thank you all for joining us. I would really like to express a sincere gratitude for the esteemed group of panelists that we had today. Uh, thank you all for the critical work that you're doing. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to actually share your expertise and um, your experience. Uh, the section on civil rights and social justice produces free webinars, and we hope this webinar has been helpful for everyone who participated in the work that you do every day. Uh, please consider joining um, the ABA, and uh, you can go to the AmericanBar.org backslash uh, CRSJ and find information on upcoming webinars. I've been informed, hot off the press, that the Environmental Justice Committee will be having um, an event on climate migration and uh, refugees, so an issue near and dear to my heart. Thank you all very much for joining us. Um, best of luck in all the work that you do, and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.